Welcome back to Sector One. First up, we should make for your motorsport fix. It's just me and Harvey today. And I personally think the reason Lily isn't here is because of this heat wave. She doesn't want to sit through half an hour plus oh, sat in this oh. heat. But uh, we're real ones, so we're still here in this. We're, we're warriors. We can fight through. What, what, what's it here? What's it over there? It's like 29 in here. Mm-hmm. It's, it's there about over here too at the minute and it's horrible i think it should be colder in manchester because it's up north so i think lily's just you know no, they're but, not used to it yet exactly anyway we're not here to talk about the weather i know we are british so that's kind of expected of us but we are here to talk about the austrian grand prix if you didn't know already Red Bull Ring, Austria. It's my favourite race on the calendar. I just absolutely adore it. It has a little bit of, it has a little bit to do with the fact it's got some luscious green grass and beautiful hills. But it actually provides some great racing time and time again. I think we've had some incredible races there. We sometimes get a surprise podium. We've had Lando Norris on the podium quite frequently in Austria, which is always exciting when you get someone who wouldn't usually be there up there. But I don't think it was too bad of a race in Austria. What did you make of it, Harvey? No, it wasn't actually too bad. Um, again, probably a bit of a shock result in my opinion. Um, I thought this would be Red Bull cakewalk. Let's just say I had, I had um, Red Bull down as one two, but um, no, uh, Leclerc taking his win um, finally, making the championship a little bit more alive. Um, obviously, Max came incredibly close, and probably one more lap. Maybe uh, there was a tiny little chance, but you know, you, if buts and maybes, you can say whatever. Um, our friend Lily actually left us a little note, just just this note to send the podcast, uh, just Max, 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 Super Max. That sounds very Lily Morris 33. I think we can definitely confirm that's her <laughs> words exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a good race from all parts in it really when I think of someone who had a really bad race obviously Emilio comes to mind Sergio Perez but I don't feel like it was that bad for everyone it was quite fair I know Sebastian Vettel probably didn't have the luckiest race either Pierre Gasly George Russell maybe even even though he did finish P4 but let's start with Charles Leclerc seeing as he did win the race I cannot believe that this is the first race he's won since Australia Australia seems a lifetime ago like but then again i can i can't believe it because mm. you know you've you you've almost seen red bull run away with it and you, you know you're still in the back of your mind you're thinking right this is a title fight we've got a title fight going on but has it been a title fight obviously yeah. ferrari won last week but it was like six red bull wins in a row that they so, are quite dominant and pe I think a lot of people think the Rebels are the fastest car but I know the Ferrari guys were talking about it this weekend that that Ferrari is still ridiculously fast they've just had a huge bout of bad luck whether that be you know failures during a race whether that be them making stupid mistakes in the race in terms of strategy or even just driver error so it's really nice to see Charles Leclerc pull it all back together because we know he has the talent. Um, yeah, it, it was a really good race. Something I want to bring up, though, talking of Charles Leclerc, but moving a little bit into Carlos Sainz at the same time, is that sprint race on the Saturday. Obviously, it started P1 Max Verstappen and P2, P3, the Ferraris, Charles Leclerc first, Sainz second. And Max Verstappen got away with the win. The win was his. Very, very clearly was his. There was no chance, really, of the Ferraris catching up. And the sole reason for that is because the Ferraris were battling each other so hard. So, Harvey, I'm curious of your thoughts on this. Do you think Ferrari need to implement strict team orders in order to not let Red Bull run away with all these wins? Because it's not just the drivers' championship, which Max will be running away with here. It's also the team constructors as well. What do you think on this? I think um, it's difficult because I think. If Ferrari had let, let's say, last race in Silverstone, if they'd let them fight on for longer, I think that may have been even Lewis Hamilton's to win. So I think Ferrari have got to be sensible. You know, they said from the off there was no number one, no number two driver. Obviously, um, Charles had been with the team for longer. He was more experienced within Ferrari, um, whereas Carlos was more experienced within Formula One. So you can see the kind of contrast between them. Um, and it looked as if they put Leclerc first this season. Um, you know, two wins in the first three races, um, pole after pole after pole. 
Um, but maybe a little bit of friendly fire isn't exactly what they need right now. You know, if they were running away with it, Lewis and Nico style, then maybe there's a margin. But if they're in tight a battle with another competitor, then I think that's what they've got to look out for. Because the championship will run away from them if they continue to fight each other. Obviously, we haven't seen them take each other out in dramatic style yet. Me saying that, I bet you that's what's going to happen at the French Grand Prix. But they (laughs) they haven't taken each other out of the race yet. And they're really good at battling. It's quite entertaining to watch both Ferraris go head to head with one another. But it does leave the other person, the other people in the race to run away if they're not fighting for the P1 place. I think if we're fighting for P1, maybe we should give them more lenience to fight. But if there is someone else in that P1 and we're fighting for lower down positions, then there needs to be something something going on there, some kind of team order that comes into play, but not too strict. It's like, let them race, but don't let them race so hard that they run away with it. That They let the person in front run away with it. You know how... um. Mercedes they do that kind of flipping a coin or whatever they do to establish who gets team orders first then they take it in turns from there at the start of the season maybe Mm -hmm. something like that could work where they're like okay it's your turn this weekend Carlos we're going to favor you a little bit more in the race but at the same time not so much that's unfair on Charles if Charles ahead of you it's really difficult territory isn't it I don't even think it's that you know you just got to be sensible I think you know, basically just say, oh, by the way, Scholl's in a really good position. He's the fastest car. He can catch up. Um, you stay behind and, you know, you know, Scholl's attack, Sainz defend. Simple as that, right? I think you can look at it in that kind of way. Um, I think there's not, you don't need to have any of this um, fair, unfair, oh, we'll let you have this this weekend, we'll let you have this this weekend. Just be sensible in the race. You know, um, no one's ever won a race by being brash with each other. Um, you know, you've got, it's, 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 it's a long old race, what, 300 kilometers. Over those 300 kilometers, you have got to keep, make sure that your position is, is not only kept, but if you're just going up slowly, that's fine. If you're losing time to the lads in front, and they're not faster, then you've got a bit of an issue there. The issue with teams and drivers in Formula One, though, is that a driver, yes, they're representing a team, but they, they're in it for themselves. No driver has the dream of, oh, I really want to win that Constructors' Championship. They all want to win the Drivers' um, Championship to but be the world champion. So it's but really I think that's the, that's the difference with, with motorsport to any other sport is that it's names, not teams. Mm-hmm. You know, he, um, you, you, ask, you ask most people um, who they support in Formula One, I reckon most people will probably give a name over a team. Yeah. But, you know, you, you know at the start of the season, oh, who's going to win the championship? I, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, Ferrari Red Bull, I'm going to go for, oh, oh, I think Max or I think Charles. You know, in Formula One, the names are a bigger brand than the team sometimes. Yeah. I think that's, it's different in some people's cases because Ferrari are just massive. Um, mm-hmm. But I think, of course, at the end of the day, what we see on the timing screens are the names. We're not watching on the, on, on the um, we're not watching, you know, oh, I wonder which team's winning. So I feel like I think... constructors is just an added bonus. It's just that little bit more of entertainment when it gets when it gets closer to battling. Like you know when McLaren was so close to that P3, it was between them and um, Renault at the time, and it was quite exciting to be like, oh god, Lando and Carlos really need to finish before the Alpines if they want to get P3 in the championship this year. That was a bit yeah. more fun because it wasn't like they were fighting for the world championship title. That's when it's more constructors. It's almost like a little a little bonus championship yeah, that the teams I'm, have to fight we're for. It this year. We're seeing it this year with with again McLaren and Alpine. Um, they're currently level on points, mm. so <clears throat> it's interesting. I think almost lower down, but when your actual self is fighting for a championship, you know, oh, Ferrari isn't fighting for the World Championship, it's Charles Leclerc. I think that's where 
you've kind of got to cut in and think, right, the team want this, but I want this. Yeah. I think that's almost where some of the entertainment from Formula One comes. Now, moving on, but staying on the Ferrari front, let's talk about the issues for both Ferraris that they endured during the race. Carlos Sainz obviously suffered his fourth DNF of the season. Heartbreak for Ferrari fans, for Sainz fans. His engine just blew. And I think it's that it's so heartbreaking because he was so, so, so close to making that move on Max Verstappen. He was literally right there and the engine blew just as he could have absolutely sent it. And it's just so heartbreaking to see because Carlos Sainz, I think he's had one one mistake this season which was his own fault during the race which ended a race and other than that he's been impeccable incredible performing to the best he's ever performed in formula one so it's really heartbreaking to see and just the way the engine blew as well we'll talk about the aftermath of that situation with carlos getting out of the car in a minute but is signs doing the right thing by staying at ferrari with how many issues he's had in terms of the car itself the mechanical functions of the car because he's had hydraulic issues he's obviously had this absolute complete engine failure does he need to stay at ferrari you can't i don't think you can put a person into the conversation of like issues out of their control Mm -hmm. because you know it's all well and good saying oh um uh give me a name lando you can all say like oh lando's not performing but if he's constantly being, I don't know, turned in on, if he's if he's had DNF off DNF off DNF and they've all been crashes or whatever, that isn't his fault. You can't just say, oh, maybe this isn't right for him because realistically it's been out of his control. And I think with 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 Carlos, it's not it's not the partnership between him and Ferrari. It is genuinely just a case of bad luck. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Formula One or daily life, you get absolutely shrouded with bad luck sometimes. I'm I'm pretty sure we've all had these, you know, we've all had these weeks where four out of the seven days, something has gone majorly wrong. And, you you know, your head in hands, absolutely like just drowning in in sorrow about it. I think it's one of those weeks for Carlos signs. I think, you know, things have gone from bad to worse, bad to worse, bad to worse, but nothing's his fault. It's just been plain unlucky to happen with him. And I think... To pinpoint it on him being at Ferrari is completely irrelevant, I'd say. I'd say um, he's doing a good job at Ferrari. He's won a race. Mm-hmm. He's got podiums. What more could you ask from him? Exactly, exactly. Let's quickly go through those four DNFs that Carlos has had, though. We've got a poster going out just before this podcast, actually, so we can speak it through. And so in Australia, that was his first DNF of the season. He had a really bad qualifying simply because the other Spaniard on the grid decided it would be a good idea to crash out, meaning Carlos was unable to set a good lap. Um, At the beginning of the race, he had to change his steering wheel really, really last minute. And so he had steering issues throughout the whole race, lost control of the car and ended up beached in a gravel trap. So I guess that is that is a failure of the car, the steering, but it's also potentially a little bit of him. Um, Imola, this was really disappointing. He did crash out in qualifying, but then he it was all to play in the race. And it ended with a crash with Daniel Ricciardo. Lovely. Ricciardo managed to keep going, but Carlos Sainz, unfortunately, was once again beached in the gravel. Baku, this was a double DNF for Ferrari this weekend, so really not good for the prancing ponies. Um, Yeah, what was happening with this one? Signs fighting Verstappen, similar to this weekend, and then he had hydraulic issues, so he literally just stopped and said, it's failed, it's failed. I think he thought it was brake-by-wire issues, but then Ferrari said after the race it was all related to those hydraulics. And then in Austria, his car went up in flames after an engine failure. So talking about that engine failure then, I want to talk about the reaction after. So when his car went up in flames, his car was rolling back a little bit and Carlos was still in the car and flames were just growing. They weren't going anywhere. They were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it seemed like no one was on the scene. There was one marshal that eventually came along, a little bit late in my opinion, and they put the fire extinguisher down and lended a hand to Carlos to get him out. Um, And obviously that did get him out of the car. 
but he had a fire extinguisher so why didn't he just straight away use the fire extinguisher i know a lot of people have come out and said this particularly in indycar marcus erickson being one of those saying that it's wrong that the the response time was redonkulous realistically it was really bad and they should have been on the scene so much quicker why why were they so slow like did you understand what was going on at this time Harvey because I was just baffled at why they were taking so long I think a few squashed toes from a rolling car is a bit better than a burnt driver yeah I, I, at this point I was out of rugby so I only got to watch this really minutes after it happened on Twitter mm-hmm. um but I think as a marshal, not that I know anything about marshalling, but as a marshal, you've got to make an executive decision of what's the bigger danger. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure rolling back, back onto the racetrack, of course it's a danger, but Carlos could control that. If you're going to leave him inside the car with his with his foot on the brake, because you know, there's no handbrake or anything, obviously. It's not no like your regular Ford Fiesta. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you haven't got a handbrake, parking brake, you know, regular Ford Fiesta or even a Ferrari. Um, you know, while he's there, you're just going to let his car burn up into flames. Realistically, and I think with common sense you put the fire out first. Yeah. Knowing that Carlos is going to do what he, he can do to stop the car from rolling, you've got to accommodate for that. I'm sure he's not going to mind. I'm sure Carlos Sainz would not have had a problem with being doused in, you know, the foam from a fire extinguisher. I'm sure he would have been completely fine with that happening. Yeah, he's, he's, not, he's not some like, little drama queen on DV. Oh, I got a little bit muddy when I was climbing up the hill. You know, he's... I'm pretty sure being burnt to death or just a little bit of foam, I'm pretty sure I, I know what, which one he's going to pick. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, um, listen, it was it, it, it was a bit, it was crazy, realistically, um, seeing what the marshals um, were going to do. Obviously, we know as well from even recent events, such as last year at Brands Hatch, we know that marshals, you know... They're godsend, they really are. <laughs> They're good sense. They're subject to danger themselves. Um, and we're incredibly lucky to have them at racetracks. But um, and I know they've got to think about not only the driver, but themselves. But at the end of the day, you, if you're making an executive decision, I'll put the fire out first. And I, I, I don't think that's crazy for me to say that, obviously. Me and my dad were speaking about this um, at the end of the race, thinking about what they could have done differently. And obviously we're speaking from completely unqualified perspective, just as fans who love the sport and, you know, have a little bit of in like knowledge about other kind of industries and steel toe capped boots. If Marshalls wore these, surely they could just stick their foot under that tire and it would block it and it wouldn't hurt them at all. They would be at no risk of hurting themselves with a steel toe capped boot. The car wouldn't have I'd rolled say, anymore. I'd say they've probably you're you're probably onto something. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's probably something they implement in like the sixties yeah. and thinking, oh, we're too technologically advanced for steel toe caps anymore. Um, but I mean, maybe maybe we just need a parking brake. That's all. Maybe maybe we need a parking brake on an F1 car. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Okay, moving on from signs then, Leclerc, after this incident, obviously, Leclerc, who's leading this race, is going to be thinking, oh my God, what about if that happens to me? And I think we potentially saw that worry come through with him and his throttle issues. So I'm sure the throttle issues were actually apparent and he wasn't just, you know, doing that out of fear because a driver's feel in that car is ridiculous because they really are almost at one with that car. As soon as something changes, they're going to pick up on it. So I don't doubt that there were throttle issues and these throttle issues meant that when he was lifting his foot off of it, it still wasn't at 0%. So when he was downshifting, there were too many revs. So it was just a bit of an uncomfortable thing. It's not It's not race ending. It's nothing like that. It's just one of those things which is probably uncomfortable and you're going to be nervous about it, particularly if you've just seen 
your teammate's car go up in flames. You're going to be worried about that. Um, but thankfully, it didn't end Leclerc's race. Thankfully, it didn't stop him from winning the race. And <laughs> it's just one of those small little issues, but it, it was nothing big. But that was something there. Moving on, I want to talk about Hamilton because I thought Hamilton was kind of nowhere at the beginning of the race. The weekend, really, to be honest with you, in the sprint race, he was battling with Mick Schumacher, which seemed ridiculous. And then at the start of the race, he was also battling with Mick Schumacher. But he was quite, he was in the top 10, but he was quite far down in said top 10. But then at the end of the race, he got himself a solid P3. And I feel like his performance really shined through at the end of the race rather than at the start of the race. And I don't know whether that has anything to do with the fuel levels in the car, possibly handling better, performing better with lower fuel samples. Obviously, all the cars do better with less fuel. Um, but whether this particularly enhanced the Mercedes pace or whether Hamilton just got a burst of energy towards the end. Um, but did you notice Hamilton not doing so well at the start? And then, because I was surprised. I was like, oh, wait, we've got Hamilton on the podium here. And obviously that was because of signs, like, but... You know, it was an incredibly tough weekend for Mercedes. Um, you know, I remember getting home Friday, like, oh, we're going to watch Qualify and let's go. Seeing them both crash out, ah, oh, bollocks. So, you know, we just, you know, we're there and <sighs> he had a tough weekend. I mean, you know, uh, Qualify's ninth um, and was eighth in the sprint. So made up one position. Uh, got the one point, which is probably all important. Um at the start, again, if you're starting anything less than about maybe fifth, you know you're going to be bogged into some sort of midfield battle. Yeah. I think, you know, the top five, top five, top four, pull away. Obviously, they'll be a leading group themselves, but you see that expand quite naturally over the first few laps. Um, Hamilton being bogged down, like, right in the centre of it, I think he had a lot, to work, a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. We know this Mercedes this year has been nowhere on the levels of uh, previous years. But I think we're seeing almost a vintage Lewis Hamilton come out in these last three races. He's scored three uh, three podiums in a row now, um, which is great. We love it. We, want, we, we wanted Lewis to come back, have a good time, and he's currently got four podiums this season uh, now, which is mental to think because... Um, we all thought George was absolutely smacking him, smacking him silly. Um, but Lewis is back, baby. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we're just seeing a, a vintage Lewis Hamilton. Maybe we're seeing um, the real Lewis Hamilton and and why he, he, he is so exceptional and where he is now. You know, when faced with problems, he's not just he's not just a driver that can lead from the front. He knows how he knows how to pick off one by one by one. We've seen that in races before, and sometimes I think we get we almost forget it just a little bit over how dominant he's been. But you think back to Brazil last year, which I think has to be one of his best, maybe his best ever weekend in in in, in Formula One. Um, you know, just picking off cars one by one by one. You know, um, disqualified from qualifying to finish to finish top of the Grand Prix. So, I think maybe maybe we're just seeing old Lewis Hamilton back. I really do hope we are because you know nothing beats an OG. Don't know what my point OG. was with that, but I'm just going to go with it. I feel like I'm suffering from heat stroke. My room is like yeah, a it's, sauna. It's, it's hard to I know. Like, I feel like I'm just like drifting off, like oh. <laughs> but we are going to carry on anyway. Um, I want to end the podcast on a high note when we do get to the end. So I'm going to leave Mick Schumacher to talk, talk about the very end of the race. So let's talk about the misconduct of fans at the track, which was very apparent this weekend. However, we cannot say that it's it's um, an isolated event. This is not just an issue at Austria. This is an issue which has been happening at a lot of racetracks now. It's, it seems to be a, an issue which is growing and growing when this issue should be, in fact, shrinking, shrinking and shrinking. Um, but there have been a lot of cases of misconduct of fans, and this involves things like racism, sexism, serious misogyny, homophobia. I've been reading some stories, some actual real-life stories about people at track have experienced things. We've had 
girls catcalled. We've had girls' skirts being lifted up and their and their backsides being touched by men who think it's appropriate. We've had um, um, we've had how do I say it in a polite way? I've, I'm losing my words. Here. We've had homosexual relationships where people are um, behind them asking them to do things because they're perhaps a lesbian couple and it's two girls and men thinking that's so cool and make asking them to do things we've had racism events we've had a fan who was letting the mercedes garage this weekend because she was being basically completely abused by male fans and i think something really important to highlight here is that it's not any driver's fault if they happen to be people wearing max Verstappen tops that's not because they're a max Verstappen fan that they're behaving that way that's because they're bad human beings and have not been taught an ounce of respect and have yeah, zero um, morals. We, we, we talked about this earlier this week and, um, you know, one, one of the things I, 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 tried to, I tried to say was basically this is not a, a Formula One problem. This is not a motorsport problem. This is not a sporting problem. This is a people problem. <laughs> it does not, you know, it does not matter who you're a fan of, um, who you are as a person, um, whatever, whatever, it does not matter. It can be anyone who is either on the receiving end or the, 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 the doing end of any of this. And I think there are, the, again, we, we talk about this as in Formula One, it happens at races. I heard the same thing with a, with a MotoGP race. You know, I've heard, of course, um, football, rugby, um, sport worldwide, you know, concerts, Again, this is not just a Formula One problem. This is a world problem, and we're, we're we're hearing all this stuff. And I think one misconception is you can't just place it on a group of people, um, on a nationality, on who they support. There are just genuinely some bad people out there, and it doesn't matter. Again, you know who they support, where they're from. You know, there are just bad people because I can tell you if you're blaming it on a certain driver's fans, I'm, I reckon a good percentage of that fan base are just good human beings, mm -hmm. good human beings with no bad conscience. But it's just a small minority just to do something. And then that's a stereotype placed on the whole group. And I think that's unfair. So I think there's a lot of things um, that Formula One could even imp implement currently. Um, just, just to make tracks a safer place. Um, because again, as I said, it would just be a start to something. You know, you can't you can't say something's gonna be hundred percent effective, but you can at least start something and then that will make a lead for change. Yeah, we have to say obviously it it was very much so highlighted at the Austrian Grand Prix. And the only reason that it's being highlighted is because so many people are feeling comfortable enough to bring it up, which is, you know, kudos to them. Well done for them speaking out about it because we can't do anything unless people speak out, share their problems. But if you are going to big events like this, I was at a concert at the weekend and the amount of sexist comments and absolute bullshit that I overheard was disgusting. I was on a tube and there was a girl who was at least a good three years younger than me, which would make her about 16 years old, and some very much so adult men behind her saying, oh, let's take a picture of her ass, take a picture of her ass, just because we're in a very cramped tube and she happened to be stood in front of her with her backside facing yeah, the guy. You know, it's even so, listen, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people just in, in environments that I am, and, you know, I, I talk to mates, and, you know, pe like, there's men coming up to them on tubes, um, you know, just random men asking them, really personal questions getting some really personal stuff out of them um almost just trying to force them into some stuff and again like i said this isn't just at formula one this is anywhere it, it can be anywhere it's, it's a I global think... problem it's not specific to any sport any fandom any entertainment industry no, of course. it's and just can, being highlighted label... at the minute you can you can label a group of fans or a group of people um, dependent on anything. You can you can label that it's a certain issue in a country. You can label that it's a certain issue in a in a in a sport. But if it's a global issue, you can take you know if you start reducing that, you're reducing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think 
you know, a leaf for change can happen at sports and, and at events, but I think that overall there just needs to be a message sent out to, to, to everyone. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, bringing it back to Formula One specifically, then. Um, me and Harvey, as well as the rest of the team, were talking about ideas of ways we can make people feel more comfortable at tracks and we have one or two ideas for this um the first one was some kind of so you know when you buy tickets to any event no matter what it is any sporting event any music event anything like that you have to tick a box for terms and conditions so we were thinking of an idea where there's another box that you have to tick and obviously you can click on it and read everything which is almost a behavioral code of conduct behaviors you have to adhere to so basically I, I'm, I will not be homophobic, sexist or racist. It feels ridiculous saying this because it should just be an absolute norm. But, but yeah, things exactly. like that, behaviour that will not be tolerated and that if any kind of behaviour of that matter is seen, um, reported, anything like that, their ticket will be invalidated and they'll be escorted off the premises and will have to endure sure. some kind of ban. And I'm sure, like, even when you were, when you were younger, you went on school trips, you had to fill out this form... Uh, a code of conduct of what you're allowed to do, what you're allowed to do, um, and you will, and you'll be sent home or something like that if any of these are broken, mm-hmm. you know. And that's to kids. The same really applies to adults. I don't think that you know you can you can you can put blame on um, again a certain age group. You can't um, just expect all adults to act in a certain way because technically they've matured. Unfortunately, it's, some people have it again. If, Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. You know, um, unfortunately, it's just how it is. You know, sometimes you need to sit an adult down and talk to them about issues that they should have really cleared up growing up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you've got to sit them down, you know, and it, it almost looks silly, right? It almost does look silly. But what they've done to put them in that position. And I think that's that's the only way to put them, put them right about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, the final idea that we all had was, um, so if you're from the UK, and I'm sure in loads of other countries they have this too, when you're on any public mode of transport, they have a number usually, you know, in, in the trains, it usually comes up like at the top on the little message board. And it's um, a text number that you can text if you have any issues at all to report on the train this could be someone catcalling you someone making you literally just feel uncomfortable on the train and you can text this with any issue you have and the train you're on or whatever where you are and they will come and find you someone will come to get you whether that be you know the conductor on the train anyone like that the ticket person that kind of thing um but they will resolve the issue and so we thought a kind of f1 text line that fans can text when they're at the track if they feel uncomfortable they can text their grandstand their seat number and someone will come and talk to them about their issue and help them feel more comfortable either find them somewhere else to go sort the person out who's being who's making them uncomfortable just something like this where people have a support network that's there that isn't necessarily their mum because you know if you're if I'm at a racetrack I don't think my parents are going to be wanting to answer my texts and coming to help me when I'm at Silverstone and they're you know at the beach somewhere so something like this that we can do to make fans feel more comfortable. Harvey did you have any other ideas on how we can make fans more comfortable at the track? No and I think uh, you know what you said about the the the, the text line or uh, the hotline I think it would, it, it honestly, it would just make a lot of sense because security, they're humans. They're, they can't watch over you 24-7. They're not, you know, they haven't just got an eye that's watching every single individual person um, over every in, individual second. So I think sometimes they can only do with so much on their own. You've got to help them out themselves. And I think a key, a key message about how we're going to change this corporation, you know, um, if you if you help the right people, then they'll help you back. And I think that that's what we need to take from this is sometimes um, sometimes you can't win battles on your own. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you'll need the help. But I think only if you help them first. And I think that's that's probably what, where we're going with the hotline. Um, just let some just let someone know what's happening and where it is, and they can help come sort it out. So I think that's one big thing. And I think 
at, at the bottom of this, we haven't talked about the result. And um, I know Sebastian Vettel did an interview about this um, yesterday, yesterday evening, about he said to hand them lifetime bans. Mm-hmm. And I, I think something we didn't mention on the on on the on the group chat is the result of all that because it's all well and good resolving the problem um, in the moment. It's just about making sure that it doesn't happen again. And you know, um, in 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 sports like football and in sports like um, in rugby, these 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 sports now, um, people are being removed from stadiums for years and years um, if they cause any security problems. Um, online racism that's been a big thing in football. Um, over the last two years, um, well, it's probably gone even further back than this really highlights over the last two years. And you see um, people, you know, obviously they're going to prison for it, but you get, they're getting stadium bans for, for, for 10 years and maybe sometimes it's not even enough. But we just, at the end of the day, some of the harsher pun- punishments can put uh, a better result for everything. So I think if we're focusing on the present, we also need to focus on the future and how we can remove the problem over the long term. Definitely. Um, just a final note on this is if you are at a racetrack and you 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 do endure something like this, there's um there's a slogan. I think it might be that transport police number or something like that. It's something that plays at, on like a train or an airport and it's see it, say it, sort it. So if you see something tell someone by saying it and then it will get sorted out and also if you if you see anyone endure sexism racism homophobia any of that stuff call it out don't just sit and let it happen because then you're just watching it you're not doing anything you can call out behavior like that and actually defend the person who's having to sit there and endure it 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 doesn't hurt to call people out when they're when they're stuck with their are very much so archaic views that, that's that's that for misconduct of fans. It's obviously a very serious problem. Um, let's talk about something a little bit more positive to end off the podcast. And this is something which is bringing joy to many, 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 many people. Mick Schumacher finished Woo! P6. P6, Harvey. Are you hearing me right now? P6. I, I was having a discussion earlier um, with, a, with a friend of mine. He was, he, he was just saying... He's he's a big he's a big Michael fan. He was just saying, you know, Michael. He he wasn't he moved to Ferrari, and there was almost this expectation to win a world championship. Mm-hmm. And he was trying for years and years and years. And as soon as he won the first one, he won five on the bounce. Are we seeing this sort of dynamic, father son? You know, once Mick has got his first points in Silverstone, is he just going to go off? Is this going to be the first point scoring of of, of many this season? I really hope so. He really does deserve it. And he has the talent. He's really showing it. I feel like I've been quite a harsh critic of Mick because I really like him that much. I think he's a great guy. Um, I feel like I've been quite harsh towards him after some of his crashes that he's had. I've been like, we just need to get rid of him. He's costing half too much money. (laughs) But he's really coming through and shining. I do wonder whether someone did sit him down and say, look, we've got budget caps and these crashes are not cheap they're costing us a lot a lot of money and we cannot not, afford to endure that I, i'm so. pretty sure he he costs um he cost the most practices out of anyone last season mm-hmm. yeah which was i do mental. wonder whether he was sat down and given a bit of a slap on the wrist and said you need to pull it around and this is what's come mm-hmm. as a result of it good there's uh intimidating enough guy i'm pretty sure if he sat me down telling me you know get my arse in gear stop crashing I, i'd be like yes sir yes, yes. Sir, i will <laughs> yes consider it done i would freak out. i think i'd cry in that situation if gunter steiner came up to me and had any kind of negative thing to say to me i would just cry straight away you know, that feeling in your stomach just gets like incredibly nervy and it's like please stop yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not when you get shouted at in school in front of the whole class and you're just like <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> but yeah Mick Schumacher P6 that's a proper handful of points under his belt now and driver of the day I really think he deserved that he's my driver of the day for sure on that um incredible performance his overtaking was impeccable you know I know some people had some complaints over the over the radio about that but Honestly, a driver is always going to complain about an overtake. Should it be a tiny little bit potentially dirty, a driver is always going to be the first one to report it because 
they won any advantage that they can get in a race. But I think it was quite good from Nick. I thought they were absolutely beautiful. The moves on Lewis Hamilton, just the way he just kept Lewis behind him, particularly in the sprint race for such a long time, was incredible to see. I really, really enjoyed it. Brilliant racing from Mick. Um, that's all I really have to say. Harvey, have you got anything to add on the race? Um, not particularly. I, I, I just mentioned as well, you know, Kevin scored points as well. That puts Haas up to seventh uh, over Alpha Tauri. So maybe maybe this, the, the Haas logic of last season, maybe it worked them a treat. Maybe They're looking like a bunch of legends right now. <laughs> exactly. They're actually looking like rock stars and not wankers. Exactly, exactly. Well, that was the Austrian Grand Prix. Next up is the French Grand Prix. We have got a week off until then. So next week, you'll have to sit through and listen to a debate between our Harvey and Maris all about what's, what's, what's better, really, old drivers or new drivers. Do we need to move on and let the old drivers go sit down in their gardens with a glass of beer? Or should we keep them on because the new guys aren't good enough yet? Harvey and Maris, debate all, and you can listen to that a week today. That is it for now. Thank you all for listening and or watching. Remember to like it if you can. Follow us at Sector 1 Motorsport. And we'll be back for the French Grand Prix.